Good morning, Astronomy 1010. Welcome to our 10th lecture. Today we'll be getting really into the nitty gritty of planets. We're going to be talking about terrestrial planetary geology. That's our subject for today. Um, how many terrestrial planets do we have? Let's ask a basic question. There are four. That's right, Ryan. And why don't you hit us with their names so that everyone knows what we're talking about? Mercury, Pluto, um, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Beautiful. I don't know why I was about to say Pluto. That's <laughs> okay. Well, Pluto has some aspects similar to a rocky or terrestrial planet in that it has a solid surface. Um, and that's about it. <laughs> uh, other than that, Pluto's composition is drastically different than that of a typical terrestrial planet. Do you guys remember what differentiates the composition of Pluto versus the composition of a terrestrial planet? What's a terrestrial planet made out of? Rocks and metals. That's right, Kim. We learned that last time when we calculated their density. And the other one's um, helium, well, gases, helium, hydrogen. Oh. Kim, uh, the, the, the Jovians are surely made out of hydrogen and helium. But what about, what about Pluto? Pluto's kind of a misfit. And traditionally, it didn't... When, all right, Pluto's not a planet anymore. We have to deal with that, okay? Um, but when it was a planet, it didn't really fit either neatly into the Jovian or terrestrial category. And one of the main reasons was its composition. Pluto's composition is neither rocks and metals. Aha, Ryan remembers, it's ice and rock. Do you guys remember what the density of water or ice, the density of water and ice are about the same. What's the density of water? One gram per cubic centimeter. What's the density of rock? Three grams per If you had to take a guess at what Pluto's density was, Jenna, what would you guess? Um, two. Or, yeah, I don't know, actually. Let's go to Google. To one significant figure, what's its density? Do you Two see? Three. Yep. Huh? Um, like two grams, or is that zero point zero zero? No, no. That this says one point eight five four plus or minus point zero zero. Oh. Yeah. So about two two grams per cubic centimeter. In other words, Jenna, you were right, weren't you? You know your stuff, don't you? Okay, that's my point. Is that you know what you're talking about? Okay. You were able to predict Pluto's density just based on your training last class on, on common densities. See how useful that is? Pluto doesn't fit neatly into either category. That's what I'm saying. Okay. What that means is today we want to talk about terrestrial planets and learn as much as we can about them. Rather than spending a lot of time talking about Mercury and then a lot of time talking about Venus, the idea is to talk about Earth a bit and then kind of talk about similarities and differences between them. This is what we call comparative planetology. As a demonstration of comparative planetology, uh, let's see if I can find, I don't wanna show you the picture just yet. Okay, yeah. Let me give you a demonstration of comparative planetology really quick. Share screen, uh, function F5, come on you bastard, function F5. What are we looking at here? What is this? The moon. You'd think so, Kim. It certainly has similarities to the moon, but we're not looking at the moon in this picture. We're looking at the surface of Mercury. Now, there's no reason you should have gotten that question correct at this point, Kim. To you, it looks like a big rock in space with a bunch of craters on it, and you're most familiar with the moon. But if you have a trained eye, there are small but important differences on the surfaces of the planets that differentiate the surface of Mercury from the moon. One of the things that I notice, I don't see any reason to keep you in suspense. Can you guys see these long marks across the surface? 
they don't look like too much to you because you're looking from a very high altitude, very like thousands of kilometers away. And so you kind of lose depth perception a bit. Things kind of flatten out. If you were to stand next to any of these cracks that you see, they would be very long cliff walls, sort of like one half of the Grand Canyon. And they stretch for hundreds or even thousands of kilometers all across the surface of Mercury. This is one of the telltale signs that would tell me we were looking at Mercury. Um, they're sometimes called escarpments or sometimes geologists just call them scarps. So you may hear me use that, that vocabulary term at some point today, scarps. A scarp is basically a long cliff wall. Remind me at some point that I should probably put that on the board. One of my points in this little demonstration was that <clears throat> we look at the surfaces of planets and we see things that they have in common and then we see things that are different. Our goal is to play a sort of planetary Sherlock Holmes and ask ourselves, what happened? What scarred the surface of this planet? What happened in the past to change these features? And how can I use that to kind of tell a story about the solar system? Let's once again, do a little mini game to that effect. I want you guys to focus on this long escarpment and the fact that it's cutting through the crater. Can any of you tell me which came first? Is the crater older or is the cliff wall older? Which came first in time? I'd say the crater would be the newer because if it, if the cliff wall came after the crater, it wouldn't really. With it, looking at it, it would be. I'm trying to. <clears throat> okay, wait. So I, this you're you're doing the right thing, Ryan. This is the kind of thing we're supposed to be doing, but let's slow down and analyze it. You said, if the crater was newer. Well, first of all, Kim, Jenna, do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with Ryan that I think the cliff wall came first and the crater is newer. Well, then we have a lot to learn. That's the incorrect answer. And let's see why. If what you guys said was true, if the crater came after the cliff wall, then the crater would have smashed that cliff wall apart and there would be no record of it. In fact, the crater is older than the cliff wall because you can see the cliff wall slicing through the crater. Does that make sense? When craters strike uh, an object, they, they deteriorate it. For instance, <clears throat> this may not be perfect, but let's look at these two craters here. You can see that this crater is the newer one because it crashes through the wall of the other crater, right? Think of the rim, they call, by the way, we call the wall of a crater its rim. Let's think about the rim of this crater. Had that crater not been there, the rim would have been intact and made a kind of quasi circular shape. The fact that this secondary crater obliterates the rim of the underneath crater shows that this crater is older and this crater is newer. Did that make sense? So you can see what happened here. And it's okay that you got this messed up because this is the first time you've ever played this game. But clearly this cliff wall at some point, this crater was there and whatever geological formation, whatever tectonic stress that fractured the surface of Mercury, it sliced through the crater and therefore the, the cliff wall itself is newer. That's interesting. That tells me these craters are really old and at one point covered the surface of Mercury and then some other geological development took place, which created these slices through the craters. What could have done that? Well, stay tuned. That's the answer. That's the answer comes with understanding all of today's story. Because we are desperate for data points, because the more planets we have, the more we can understand what geological forces made them different from one another, we, we want to, to include in today's lecture, not only the four terrestrial planets, but we're also going to include the moon. Now, obviously, oh shoot, cancel. Sorry, let me try that again. Obviously the moon is not a planet and that's mostly because it's a satellite of earth. It orbits around earth instead of the sun directly. Sorry, I think Ryan might've been trying to chip in. Oh yeah, okay, there we go. But if you think about it, 
the moon is actually unusually big for a terrestrial moon. It's actually comparable to some of Jupiter's largest moons. And the moon itself, I believe, is larger than Pluto, which used to be a bona fide planet. In some ways, the moon is a perfectly valid terrestrial object. It's made of rock and metal, although it's going to turn out not very much metal. It's got a solid surface, it's close to the sun, and it shares many geological features with its pal Mercury, which is covered in impact craters and rock. For that reason, it's going to be useful for us to compare all of these objects together and see the story of, uh, of how geological planets form. Another thing for you guys to remember is last class, you learned about, um, you learned about the nebular theory, right? about the solar system forming 4.6 billion years ago from a homogeneous cloud of dirty hydrogen and helium gas. I would like to propose this question to you. If these planets all formed at the same time from the same batter of bisquick, the same homogeneous, well-mixed, dirty hydrogen and helium gas cloud, how the F did we end up with these five freaks and weirdos we call the terrestrial planets today? No two are exactly alike, and yet they were all born of the same nebular goo. The answer to that question is, well, physics, geology, and time. And today we want to learn a little bit about that. So let's take some notes on our planetary surfaces. Let's get into some business here today. Uh, I want to go to speaker view and I want to click on me. Okay. A smart thing to do actually is to list the radii of the planets. That's going to tell us something. Rather than list them in order of their distance from the sun, let's rank them biggest to smallest. Of course, the largest of the terrestrial planets is Earth. And Earth has a radius you've heard many times of 6,400 kilometers. Venus is in some ways considered our sister planet with a radius of basically 6,000 or 6,100 kilometers. Venus's size is super close to Earth. And yet, it turns out that even these two planets formed and developed in a very different way. The next biggest of the terrestrials is Mars, but Mars is significantly smaller. Its radius is 3,400 kilometers. Next comes Mercury. Mercury, I'm pretty sure it's 2,400 kilometers. And of course, the smallest of our terrestrial planets is the moon. Today, you'll have a lab on the moon, 1,700 kilometers. By the way, today's lab, uh, before I forget, is lab nine, studying the craters of the moon. You'll see some moon maps, and um, there's one data sheet that you need for today. Today's lab is fun and simple. If you're the type of person that has to print out uh, labs, I just want to take a quick pause and say, uh, lab nine, the only thing you really need to print out or reproduce today, you're going to want to use these photograph, and you're going to want to use these moon maps, but you can follow along with mine. This lunar features PDF is really the only thing you need today to do our lab. Okay, just one sheet. In fact, my printer's a little pokey, so I'm going to hit print now before I forget, because I will easily forget. All right, so here you have our five terrestrial objects ranked in order of their radii. And let's kind of come up with a sort of Goldilocks and the five planets analogy. I like to think of Earth and Venus as a sort of classic example of what would be considered a large or a big terrestrial planet. In fact, there are advanced reasons why Earth is probably close to about the biggest a terrestrial planet could be. Had Earth formed any more massive or any larger 
during the formation of our solar system, it would have potentially reached the correct mass and radius where its gravity could have begun to pull hydrogen and helium gas right out of the protosolar nebula down onto its surface. Earth, in other words, had it been a bit more massive, a bit bigger, it had the potential to become what we call in planetary science, a hot Jupiter, a gas giant that forms weirdly close to the sun in the traditional terrestrial zone. Mars is kind of a medium sized um, terrestrial planet. And you'll see for some reasons, uh, or, or for this reason, it has some features in common with Earth and Venus, some features in common with Mercury and the moon. So here's your medium sized terrestrial planet. And then of course, Mercury and the moon, these are what I would consider to be small terrestrials. If they got too much smaller, they'd probably end up turning into asteroids. As you learn more planetary science, you stop seeing so much hard division between terrestrial, Jovian, and you see a kind of gradient that goes from asteroid, comet, to terrestrial, to Jovian, and then to star. They all formed from the same batter, from the proto-solar nebula. If you guys wanted, I could once again show you an artist illustration. We're going to need this later on anyways. I forgot to show you pictures like this last time, but here's a, <clears throat> you know, no one was around 4.6 billion years ago with their GoPros to actually observe how the solar system formed. And that's why we need to rely on our weed smoking artist friends who are good at illustration and drawing to draw us a picture of what the early solar system might have looked like. So here's a weed smoking illustration of, of the early solar system. You can see the protostar there, and you can see this giant swirling disk of dirty hydrogen and helium gas. There's pro probably little flecks of rock in there and little flecks of ice in there. And this is the bisquick from which our, our terrestrial planets and our Jovians formed. Now, the Jovians turned out radically different. That's a story for another day. Today, you learn about terrestrials. Okay, now it's time for another popular science reference. Apparently there's this new movie out called Kong versus Godzilla. And my friends have been telling me about it this weekend. And in the plot synopsis here, plot spoilers, watch out. I think they go to the center of the earth and in the center of the earth, they find, wait for it, dinosaurs, okay? I noticed that Ryan's got a dinosaur shirt on today. So this should be a subject near and dear to his heart. Um, believe it or not, they're riffing on another famous sci-fi novel in Jules Verne's journey to the center of the Earth. Some intrepid explorers also dig a hole to Earth's center. They travel to the center of the Earth, and guess what they find there, Ryan? Dinosaurs. Exactly. <laughs> Dinosaurs at the center of the Earth. And this gets me thinking, <clears throat> have we ever been to the center of the Earth? Has any human being ever traveled there? Hell no. What do you think the deepest a human being has ever gone into the interior of our planet is? Um, like bottom of sea level? We've certainly gotten to the sea level. And if you're James Cameron, director of Titanic, you've even built your own personalized torpedo submarine that took him to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. The, the average depth of the ocean floor is maybe four kilometers down. And the Marianas Trench goes like seven kilometers beyond that. But that's not actually into the interior of Earth. Who goes into the interior of Earth? Miners, oil drills, people who are drilling for oil off the, the coast. Oil drills typically go two to five kilometers down. There are a couple of wacky exceptions to that. It turns out that one of the deepest points that humans have ever burrowed into the interior of Earth for years, the record was held by this weird scientific expedition in Russia called the Kola Super Deep Borehole. It's now been sort of terminated and shut down, but it's worth going on a little wiki adventure with me. Let's look up the Kola Super Deep Borehole. For years, this was the deepest point um, on Earth. It was a scientific expedition by the 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 the, the Russian Science Federation, I don't know what they're called exactly, but they, they basically drilled 
a big pipe or a small pipe rather down to a depth of 12 kilometers. And still today, the deepest we've ever gone into the interior of Earth is roughly 12 kilometers. Um, it's kind of interesting. Today, the Kola Super Deep Borehole is a deactivated science uh, installation. And um, this is the, it's basically in this industrial metal scrapyard. You could go there and you could actually look at the sealed up pipe sitting right there in the ground. <laughs> Does anyone know why you can't simply drill a hole to the center of the earth? What, what are the technological challenges? What, what happens if you try to go too deep into the interior of earth? Uh, at some point, you uh, magma, um, yes. Yes, magma is warm rock. At some point, that will be an issue, Ryan. But even before you get to magma, pressures go up and temperatures go up as you burrow down into the earth. So at some point, the pressure of the overlying rock will just crush you. I mean, if you think about it, even today's top rated nuclear submarines, they can't go to the bottom of the ocean floor without collapsing due to internal pressure. So if a nuclear submarine can't get down four kilometers with just water sitting over your head, rock is three times as massive per cubic, or per cubic meter, right? And so to, as you go down into the interior of Earth, pressures will crush you. What percentage then have we explored the interior of Earth? Let's calculate it. Jenna, maybe you could punch that into your calculator for us. What is 12 kilometers? That's the Kola super deep borehole. As a fraction of 6,400 kilometers. Sorry, I was muted. Do I just divide 12 by That's it, baby. Percentage oh. is 101. I got 1.8 um, times 10 to the, or 1.9 times 10 to the negative third. Okay, now round 1.9 to two and tell me how to write it out without scientific notation. That's punishing. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be zero point zero zero two fine what is that as a percentage now 0.2 percent yeah or two tenths of a percent what's my point do i have a point i'm trying to make a point does anyone have ears we have uh, that oh sorry go ahead mm -hmm. ryan chime in um, so the point that I, I think you're trying to make is that how little we have actually explore, explored? Yeah, we've basically gone 0% into the interior of Earth. And we ain't found dinosaurs down there, or at least not yet. Okay. So <laughs> okay, so Ryan, I'm about to give you a lecture about what the interior of the terrestrial planets hold. How could I know such a thing? How do scientists know what the interior of Earth is if no one's been to the interior of Earth? There's no reason you should know the answer to that question, but I wanted to get your noodles cooking here. The reason why we know what's in the interior of Earth is actually because of seismic waves. I'm talking earthquakes. Earthquakes are a method of probing the interiors of terrestrial planets. So let me just, oops, sorry here, I'm all over the place. Let me uh, get out of these different slideshows. Let me jump ahead to my lesson on seismic waves. Every time there is an earthquake, and I don't know how much you guys know about earthquakes, but uh, oops, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button here. Function, oh, okay. Oops. What the hell is wrong with me? Technology, guys. Function F5. Oh, enable this. Sorry. I... All right. What was? I'm just going to do this manually. 
every time there's an earthquake, say in Indonesia, or even, I don't know if you guys remember this, but we had an earthquake during the fall semester, last semester, and everyone's house was shaking. Did you guys, did anyone experience that besides me? You, you felt that, Jenna, right? That was extraordinary. I was lying in my bed, and I'm in downtown Providence, and my bed started to rock back and forth. And I was like half asleep because it was ungodly early for someone like me. And I remember thinking that vibration was too potent to be a truck. That had to be, could that have been an earthquake? I was beside myself and it turns out it was like a magnitude four earthquake centered over in Fall River or something. Um, <clears throat> earthquakes take place when geological forces cause different parts of the earth's, let's call it crust for now, but we're gonna have a better term later. Parts of the earth crust press up against each other and build up just humongous amounts of pressure over long geological time periods. And eventually the pressure gets so intense that they sort of slip over the top one another in a, uh, in a, a, a very rapid manner. And they, they actually cause uh, vibrations throughout the rock that travel throughout earth. When you, when you tap on a wall, uh, when you throw a pebble into a pond, you make waves in a solid or a liquid substance. And in physics, there are two types of waves that we recognize. Um, they're the same, these, these formations are the same whether you're talking about light waves or sound waves or even seismic waves, the waves that travel through rock. Uh, a slinky can be used to demonstrate both types of waves. The, the types of waves where you wiggle a string back and forth are called transverse waves. And what makes a wave transverse is that the displacement of the wave is perpendicular to the direction of the wave's travel. So if I take a, a, a whip like Indiana Jones, or if I, if I make some undulations on a string or a cord, the, the wave displacement is up and down, but the waves travel left to right. There's another type of wave that you can make with a slinky called compressional or longitudinal waves. And I'm going to try to demonstrate that here. Show and tell time. Uh, let's see if I can do a passable job of this uh, over the screen here. Oh, hold on. I got a tangle. Oh, geez. Sorry, guys, I gotta. Oh, fuck. Oh. All right, I'm breaking things. <laughs> Here we go. Um, yeah. So, you know, this is a transverse wave here, right? A compression or a longitudinal wave is where you have some, some density, some, some sort of homogeneous density. In this case, it's a linear density on a string. And then you create a compression. If I bunch up a bunch of this string into a little compression, it will form a rarefication on either side as I pull parts of the string together. And we might even be able to demonstrate this. Let's make a compression and let's let it go. Boink. It's happening quite quickly, but those vibrations you can see are actually the, the little compression that I made traveling back and forth and oscillating between my two hands. This demonstration would be more effective if I could get a compatriot to stand across a classroom with me, but our, our field of view for our camera isn't very big, so I can only do a kind of very quick compressional wave. Every time there's an earthquake, you get both compressional waves and you get transverse waves. And geologists have special names for these seismic waves. They call these waves P waves. P stands for primary, but I like to think of it as a pressure wave because you're making a compression. And then an S wave <clears throat> is, is the transverse wave. It turns out that S waves and P waves travel through rock and metal at different rates and in different ways. We know from studying the density of our terrestrial planets, and Jenna reminded us today, a terrestrial planet is made of rock and metal. Jenna, which is denser, the rock or the metal? Metal. That's right. Now, 
if you drop a stone into water, the stone is heavier and it sinks towards the bottom. It's a reasonable assumption that the metal will over time sink into the center of Earth because it's denser than the rock. And we know that it's going to be warm in the interior of Earth. And there's a damn fine chance that some of that metal is going to be so warm that it will be melted in, in a liquid form. It turns out that whereas P waves can propagate through liquid metal, S waves, the side to side waves cannot. So what we do is we set up seismographic stations or rather the geologists set up seismographic stations all over earth, which are very sensitive, well, let's call them thermometers or something, very sensitive instruments which can measure tiny vibrations in rock. And every time an earthquake happens anywhere on earth, all of the different geologists measure the vibrations and the ratios of S waves to P waves that they get they all share the data. And based on that data, they can calculate how big the metal core is of Earth based on which S waves and P waves are blocked. So this is kind of a long-winded story, but it's, this is to explain to you, earthquakes and seismic waves are the way that we study, the, the way that we probe the interior of Earth without having to drill a hole to the center of the planet. And this is how we know the things that we know. By the way, uh, not only do we study earthquakes on Earth, the, the Apollo astronauts that went to the moon set up seismographic stations there to attempt to measure moonquakes. Turns out the moon doesn't have a lot of geological activity. There aren't many moonquakes at all. Um, and most recently, there's an expedition to Mars, a rover that landed on Mars that you guys might not have heard about before. It's called the Mars InSight lander um and it's basically a super sensitive seismograph that they landed on the surface of mars supposedly this seismograph is so sensitive that it can detect vibrations from meteorites striking the opposite side of mars and can measure propagations uh, of rock vibrations on the other side of the planet so it's super sensitive. And, and the reason why we landed this craft on Mars is because we know that studying seismographic ways is, are, are the ways we can learn about the interior of Mars. We do not have a seismograph on Venus because Venus is a hostile fucking planet. It is not easy to land a, sorry. It, it's not easy to land a spacecraft there. The only time we ever did it, the spacecraft melted in about five minutes. We only have one picture from the surface of Venus. And I'll show it to you later in this class or maybe tomorrow or Wednesday's class. However, we still attempt to measure earthquakes on Venus by bouncing very sensitive radio waves off its surface. It's not as good as having a seismograph stuck into the planet. At some point, we would love to have that. But the point is, Venus is just a bad place for anything besides hot, melted rock. <laughs> it's... The pressures are too intense there. The, the atmosphere is caustic. The temperatures are stupid high. Okay, now it's time to learn something new. Let's learn about the interior of Earth. Um, did you guys ever have to, when I was a kid, when I went to like elementary school, or what, what's, what's in between elementary school and high school? It's grade school, right? I had to take an Earth science class where I learned simple facts about the Earth. Do you guys still have to do that? Did you take an Earth science class at some point? I don't, I don't know for everyone else, but I know I I had oh, to take really? one of those. Well, what the hell were you doing then? Sorry. Anyways, what's the interior of Earth made of? Do you know the layers of Earth? Have you heard this before? Yes, uh, layers are for the mantle, crust, outer core, and inner core. I think I may be forgetting one or two, but no, no, those are the ones good. I remember. That's pretty good. So... I don't know where you learned that, Ryan, but at some point, somebody taught that to you. And I'm, I'm glad that you had some exposure to that. That's the kind of classic, let me show you the, the diagram of what Ryan was talking about there. The classic sort of um, what's the interior of earth thing that you learn as a grade stu school student is the earth has a crust, a mantle, and yes, there are two two types of core, but right now we're just gonna say crust mantle core. That's how I learned it when I was a kid. 
when you model the interior of Earth like this, you're doing it based off density. And density, we have already learned, is a tracer of chemical composition. Every atom on the periodic table of elements has a unique density. So measuring the density of something is akin to sort of describing what it's made out of. The rocky crust of Earth is low density. The mantle has a medium density and the core has a high density. The fact that Earth kind of looks like a Tootsie Roll has to do with the fact that when Earth first formed, a lot of the rock and metal would have been kind of mixed together because they came from the well-mixed proto-solar nebula. But over time, just as a stone sinks in water, the metal in the, in the planet will slowly slurp and sink its way towards the center of the planet, kind of leaving this kind of layered cake appearance to Earth. Geologists make a big deal about this. It's called the differentiation of Earth's interior. And it's something we have to think about because there's a lot of physics behind this. It turns out that this is only one way, one way of modeling the interior of Earth, and it's not necessarily the best way. Today, you're gonna learn that there are two ways of layering Earth, one by density and the other one by strength or rigidity. So let's take some notes on this. This little module is gonna be called Two Ways to Layer the Earth. or two ways to layer Earth's interior. We're gonna make a table because I like to do those kinds of things, okay? Um, there's first by density. Density is a tracer of chemical composition. The new way, the way that you probably haven't heard about unless you've taken a geology class, is by strength of the, of the layered material. Uh, other words that we could use for strength are rigidity or maybe even plasticity, their ability to bend and flow. Let's write the other ones down too. Okay. If we layer the earth by density, it's the same story. Crust, mantle, and core. And let's talk a little bit about the differentiation of earth's layers. The crust is low density. Remember that I use the symbol delta for density. And it's mostly made of silicate rock. In fact, you'll often hear geologists refer to rocks as silicates. Now, here's a badass rock that I found on Goosewing Beach one day. All right, looks like a piece of granite to me. I know you all know what a rock is, right? But seriously, what's a rock? Does anyone know the definition of a rock? Like, you know what a rock is, right? Come on, don't mess with me. No, but really, what's a rock? How do we define a rock? It's kind of a funny question, right? Do you really know what a rock is? What do you know about rocks? Nothing? None, none of you have taken a geology class, I guess, huh? What about Ryan in the background there? Ryan the troll. You loosely know the three types of rocks. Okay, hit us. Sedimentary, igneous, that kind of stuff, right? Okay, Ryan, you're not typing as fast as you said you were going to. No, well, okay. It's time for us to define a rock. A rock is an aggregate of minerals. That means it's a smushy mishmash of minerals, okay? Minerals could be anything from feldspar to ruby, 
to salt, okay? Um, let's, let's just have a little kid's break and learn about rocks, okay? Most of the Earth's crust is actually made of granite. Um, granite or basaltic rock, one of those two. And, and here's a picture of granite, similar to the one that I was holding in my hands. Granite is different depending on where you go on Earth. But here's a representative sample of granite that, that is broken down by mineral composition. These are the minerals. You'll notice that 72% of this granite is made of the mineral silicon dioxide. That's one atom of silicon and two oxygens stuck to it. This is what a geologist means by silicates or silicate rock. It's silicon with oxygens stuck to it, okay? Um, one of the other common types of silicate, this is silicon dioxide, and there's also quartz, which is silicon tetraoxide. You will find that most rocks that you've ever encountered in your life, no matter how weird or bizarre, either have silicon dioxide or silicon tetraoxide as their primary ingredient. The rest are lower percentage metals like aluminum, potassium, and sodium that are also stuck to oxygen. You know what I like to think of a rock as? A rock is kind of like a fluffy metal, okay? You take some atom made of metal like aluminum or calcium, and you stick some oxygens to it, and it makes it lower density. Any chemist who heard me say that or geologist would probably try to chop my head off. But I'm going to go there and I'm going to say uh, a rock is a fluffy metal, okay? That's what it is. It's a lower density metal. In fact, <clears throat> you know what's weird? They call rock silicates. But imagine you could take like an alien ray gun and just vaporize the crust of Earth into a pile of atoms. Cue up the science fiction music here. What you would discover is 50% of the Earth's crust is in the form of oxygen atoms. 30% of the crust is in the form of silicon atoms. And all the rest are just random metals. So Earth's crust is silicon plus oxygen together. There's your silicon uh, dioxide, right? It's one part silicon to two parts oxygen. So oftentimes geologists will say silicates as a kind of substitute for rock. Your book, for instance, says the crust is made of silicates, okay? The mantle is a mixture of silicates plus some metals mixed in. And by the time you get down to the core, you've become so differentiated that it's both basically metal. Do you, uh, Ryan, know what, what metals? There's two primary metals that the Earth's core is made out of. This would be a nice time for show and tell. Iron. Here's an iron meteorite. Iron and nickel are the primary metals that Earth's core is made out of. Now, there's some interesting reasons why iron and nickel are the primary metals that make up planetary interiors. They actually have something to do with white dwarf stars and type 1a supernovae. The dramatic deaths of stars tend to produce big bursts of iron that get scattered throughout the galaxy. But I can't teach you about that because you haven't paid another $550 to take my stellar system course. However, I will be offering it during summer session one. So there's a pitch. If you'd like to know about the origin of Earth's uh, nickel and iron core, you can sign up for my stellar system course, which also constitutes a four credit lab science and will help you towards graduation. Think about it, okay? All right, so <laughs> um, anyways, this is just one way for us to layer the interior of Earth. The other way is by strength. And let's think about it. When people start talking about Earth crust, your mind begins to wander to that other type of crust that is so important to you, and that's pie crust, OK? In fact, when we think of Earth's crust, we tend to think of it in terms of a sort of crispy, flaky outer layer maybe with warm, hot apples and cinnamon on the inside, our experience of crust is really our experience of pie crust. And then we're kind of imagining that as the outside layer of Earth. In fact, when you imagine Earth's crust as pie crust, you're really not layering it by 
density anymore. You're now layering it by strength. And I have a new vocabulary word for you guys today, maybe the most important you're gonna learn all day. It's called the lithosphere. And the lithosphere is what you're actually thinking about when you, when you think about Earth's crust. The lithosphere is defined as the hard, brittle, frozen outer layer of a terrestrial planet. And that's a definition that I'll put up on the board in just a moment. Let's go to slide 20. You'll notice that Earth's lithosphere extends quite a bit deeper than the crust. Whereas the crust, the outer silicate rock layer, can vary from 8 to 80 kilometers, Earth's lithosphere extends deeper, a little bit into the mantle where the densities change, and the frozen brittle outer layer is anywhere from 100 to 300 kilometers. Where do you think the lithosphere would be the thickest? I, mean, I just want to ask what I think is a wicked simple question that maybe you can answer. Why does the why does the crust vary in height? Why does the lithosphere vary in height? Where would it be thicker? Where would it be thinner? Wouldn't it be thinner the higher up to the crust? It would be thinner or higher up to the crust because it's separated by density. No, no, no. If, I think maybe I, my question is. Where on earth would, would we expect the crust or the lithosphere to be thickest? And where on oh, earth? Oh, okay. That's what I'm asking. Uh, would the lithosphere be thickest um, where land is? Or Not by the pole? Land, try to imagine like the highest point on earth, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe like- Mountains. Yeah, mountains, the Himalayan mountains. These are where you'd expect it to be thick. Where would you expect it to be thinnest? Oceans and bodies of water, valley. In, in, uh, yeah, there are there are valleys like rift valleys, but in particular, there are places in the ocean where the sea floor becomes so thin that it actually exposes the mantle, or actually, what I'll later define as the asthenosphere underneath it. And I don't know if you guys have heard of these deep ocean trenches, or like like for instance, the Mid Atlantic Ridge. Let's type in Mid. Atlantic Ridge. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is basically like a, a fault line or a, a, a giant fissure that runs all throughout uh, the Atlantic Ocean. It's actually one of the least well-explored places on Earth because it's so deep in the ocean floor that there are only one or two vessels that can actually make it there. But the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, we've only explored like 2% of its, of, of its length basically is it's almost like a little i don't want to call it a it's a type of volcano in a way but it's a place where the warm convecting rock of earth that 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 warm mantle can actually push its way up into the seafloor bed and the few vessels that have gone to the mid-atlantic ridge have basically found plumes of boiling water and uh they call them sometimes black smokers it's basically kind of like a nonstop underwater volcano. There's even some crazy living organisms that live under there. Check out this totally wild and cool picture of the giant tube worms, which live along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is deep down in the ocean, pitch darkness. Very few marine organisms can survive these hostile conditions. And those are basically billowing clouds of sulfur dioxide just coming out of the, the the, the Earth's interior, that's where the Earth's crust is actually at its thinnest. A lot of interesting geology and biology happens there. Anyways, let's let's start layers of Earth by strength. First, we have the lithosphere. This is a, a new vocabulary term for many of you, so we're going to define this. It's the hard, brittle, and importantly, it's frozen, it's cold, okay? The hard, brittle, frozen outer layer of a planet. And we're gonna not only be talking about Earth's lithosphere, but as planetary scientist junior, we're gonna be talking about the lithospheres of other planets as well. Underneath the lithosphere is a layer called the asthenosphere. 
or the asthenosphere. It's tempting to think that if you could poke through Earth's lithosphere, you'd find what you think of as, as, as volcano lava, right, or, or magma. But it turns out that this material is under so much pressure that it's really in the form of solid rock. As you know, materials can exist in one of three or four different phases of matter. You're a solid, you're a liquid, you're a gas, if you're really weird, you could be a plasma or even a Bose-Einstein condensate, but let's forget about that for a moment. Solid, liquid, or gas. The material under Earth's lithosphere is under so much pressure that it is forced into the solid state. But this ain't your pappy's solid. This ain't like the cold lump of iron that I have in my hands here. This is solid matter that is hot and warm. And because it's warm rock, it can actually flow kind of like a plastic. Uh, the book makes an analogy with silly putty. Would you guys consider silly putty to be a solid or a liquid? A solid. Right. I would consider it to be a solid too. And yet, Jenna, it has some pesky properties that make it kind of like a liquid, right? One of the definitions I learned for solids versus liquids versus gases is a gas holds neither its volume nor its shape. A liquid will hold its volume, but not its shape. A solid maintains volume and shape. Silly putty is a solid that can flow. When you take it out of that little plastic egg, the silly putty has flowed into the egg shape because it's, it's molded to the dimensions of its container, just like a liquid would. And, and we actually call those materials plastics. They're kind of somewhere in between a solid and a liquid in that they seem solid, but over time they can flow. This is how you want to think of the asthenosphere. It's solid rock that can flow, all right? So this is warm convective solid rock. And I'm going to, that flows. I'm going to be really redundant about this, OK? The asthenosphere plays a very important role in planetary science because on Earth, which has an active set of plate tectonics, the asthenosphere is kind of like a, a solid rock ocean on which the lithosphere floats and drifts and moves over time. If you've heard of continental drift, if you've heard of Pangaea, the fact that Earth rearranges its continents from time to time, this is related to the fact that the lithosphere and the asthenosphere create a set of plate tectonics on Earth. If you go even lower, the rock becomes more solid. You get to a layer called the, the mesosphere. The mesosphere is kind of similar to the mantle. And then Ryan mentioned that the core has two layers to it. There is an outer liquid metal core. And then there's an inner solid metal core. Take a guess. Which is the hotter, the warmer layer? The outer liquid metal core or the inner solid metal core? The inner core is hotter? Yes. I can't trick Jenna. She's too good at science. I was seeing if I could trick one of you to say, oh, the liquid core has to be hotter because it's in the liquid form. But Jenna knows better. She knows that the hottest point on Earth, just like the hottest point on the sun, should be the absolute center of Earth. Why then, Jenna, is this in the solid form while that's in a liquid form? What's the simple answer to that question? Density or compression? Yeah, pressure. Pressure or compression. You're basically squeezing this rock back into a solid phase because the pressure is built up too much. In fact, as a way of demonstrating that, and this is kind of a useful graph to look at for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the triple point of water, but they make these, they call them phase diagrams. And I think it's good for you all to occasionally look at a graph and try to think about this. This is the, the version that I love here. I think this is an information rich uh, graphic here. And let's look at our two axes. On the vertical axis, we are pr plotting pressure in pascals 
Notice they go from one Pascal at the bottom up to a hundred a terapascal. Do you guys remember what uh, sea level pressure is? What's the pressure of air in this room? I taught that to you. What do you remember? What was what was the question? What's the pressure of what? Of air at sea level. Oh. No one? Okay, I thought you guys might be cool for a second, but I can see I was mistaken. This is the pressure at sea level, 100 kilopascals, okay? Hashtag never forget. 100 kilopascals is the pressure of air in this room. Okay, you have lived your whole pedestrian life at 100 kilopascals of pressure. You know, humans can handle a bit of temperature variation, but we ain't so good with pressure variation. Just think about how your ears pop when you go up in an airplane, and that's still a pressurized cabin. Humans do not like changes in pressure. That tends to be extremely uncomfortable. You've lived your entire life on this line, and you understand warm, cold, solids, liquids, and gases at this line. You know that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius and that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. But if you modify the pressure, everything goes out the window. For instance, if you were to put some water down into the center of Earth, where pressures can probably get up to 100 gigapascals or something like that. I'm not exactly sure what the max pressure is, but it's probably crazy. Water can no longer exist in any liquid or vapor state because it's under so much pressure that you will force it into ice. Could you imagine what 350 degrees Celsius solid ice would look like or feel like? That would be really strange and weird to you. It would probably be glowing. It would probably be so hot that you would be holding a glowing block of ice. That is that is mind screwy, okay? On the other hand, if you were to travel to the surface of Mars, Mars does have an atmosphere, but its pressure is way less than Earth's. It has a very thin atmosphere. And Mars is, of course, colder than Earth because it's 1.5 AU from the sun. It's further than Earth from the sun. But if you went to Mars and you took a cup of water and opened it up in Mars's atmosphere, even though Mars is probably at negative 40 or negative 50 degrees Celsius as an average daytime temperature, the water in that cup would boil because Mars has such a low atmospheric pressure that that water would boil at negative 40 degrees Celsius. That's pretty weird, okay? So Mars is like somewhere over here in terms of its air pressure. Anyways, I want you guys to remember that temperature and pressure go hand in hand to determine whether something is solid or a liquid or, or a gas. And Jenna kind of intuitively understood that, so that makes me happy. Okay, how am I doing on time here? 113. Now it's time for us to zoom out of Earth and let's, let's learn a lesson here about planetary science. What if we could probe the interiors of the other terrestrial planets? What would we find? Let me show you a really interesting graphic, a really useful graphic. It's, it's a hybrid graph showing you the interiors of the other terrestrial planets. Now, here I've made a hybrid of the two different ways of layering Earth, and I'm layering all the terrestrial planets that way. At first, I've done it by the classic density model, where we go crust, mantle, and core. And if you do that, you basically see that all terrestrial planets kind of look the same in the interior. They all have a crust of silicate rock. They all have a mantle of medium density stuff. And they all have a core of metal, maybe except the moon, whose core is so stupidly small that it almost doesn't exist. It turns out that layering by density doesn't tell you a lot about terrestrial planets because they're all kind of the same, a differentiated Tootsie roll of rock and metal. But now superimposed over this, I've also plotted the lithosphere, the thickness of the frozen outer layer. You can see that Earth and Venus as sister planets have very thin lithospheres. They extend down a little bit past the crust, but that's it. So in other words, the crust and the lithosphere are kind of the same on Venus and Earth. But look at Mars, look at the moon and to some degree Mercury. 
What is the depth of the lithosphere telling us about Mars? Does that mean anything to you? Could it be that it's made of like, instead of Earth being made of more like higher density materials and for across now? No, Ryan, because remember, density is the same as chemical composition. And here in the colored picture, we are, we're layering these planets by density and chemically they are the same. They're made of the same thing. They've got a silicate crust, they've got a silicate and metal mixture for their mantle, and they've got a nickel iron core. So the point of this graph is actually the opposite, Ryan. All these planets are made of the same stuff. The lithosphere is telling you something else. But what could that be? Is it the temperature? Like, since it's made up of frozen, is that why Mars is significantly colder? Uh, OK, there's talking about the surface temperature of a planet, and there's talking about the interior temperature of a planet. I'm glad you said that, Jenna, because we really got to straighten that, those two things out. Planets have surface temperatures, and that's one thing. They have interior temperatures, and that's a totally different thing. In fact, they're not related to each other at all. What do you think controls the surface temperature of a planet? Something really yeah. obvious. Um, the atmosphere? That contributes a bit, but it's even more than the atmosphere. What do you think the hottest planet in the solar system is? Oh, the one closest to the sun. Right, except you're wrong. The hottest planet is not Mercury. The hottest planet is Venus. <laughs> OK, anyways, <laughs> I'm, I'm intentionally trying to confuse you right now. Listen. There are two factors that determine, well, there's three factors that determine your surface temperature. The most important is your distance from the sun, okay? But the secondary issue is the atmosphere, like you said. The reason Venus is, the surface of Venus is hotter than Mercury because of Venus's runaway greenhouse effect. It's a big, thick blanket of CO2 gas covering the planet. If you ignore Venus, the surface temperature drops as you get farther from the sun, just like you would predict, okay? So after Venus, the second hottest planet is Mercury. The third hottest planet is Earth. The fourth hottest planet is Mars. The interior temperatures of a planet don't depend on their distance from the sun. They kind of depend upon how much matter is there. And, and that's where gravity comes into play, uh, Jenna. So Jenna, you were correct in saying, that the depth of your lithosphere determines how frozen cold your planet is. Mars has lost its internal heat. Let's take a few more notes before we end our lecture for the day. Can I erase this? Do you guys have all that? So we're basically going to write down exactly what you said, Jenna. And let's write it down as a key idea from today's uh, class. Here's a key idea. The depth of a planet's lithosphere is an indication of its and here's the key concept, internal heat. And I'd like to make the same point that I made a moment ago, because it turns out that repeating myself is a useful thing to do. Um, internal heat is not the same as surface temperature. Surface temperature, we're going to have to address at a later time when I can deal with the complexities of atmospheres. Today, I'm dealing with what's interior to a planet and what's at the surface of a planet. Why do planets get hot as you go down into their centers? Because of gravity. Because when you smush things and when you smush them hard, it tends to heat them up. If you compress a gas, it warms the gas. If you compress rock or metals or liquids, they get hot too. Let's talk about sort of three ways planets get internal heat.
The first idea is that when a planet forms 4.6 billion years ago, it would have been so freaking hot that it would have been glowing. Earth's surface would have been glowing almost like a star. It would have been warm. Basically, the surface of Earth probably would have looked like volcanic lava, just liquefied glowing rock. And the reason why has to do with how a planet forms. Um, let's take a trip out in our mind to the protosolar nebula. Let's get our weed smoking artist friends off their bean bag and let's put some crayons in their hand and see if they can draw a picture for us that, that, that explains what the protosolar nebula would have looked like, okay? So here's a picture where we can imagine a swirling disk of gas and little bits of rocky and metal debris. And probably the initial bits begin to stick just by collisions and static forces, a little bit of static cling pulling little bits of grains of sand together. But eventually this material through collisions starts to form some big lump of rock some overgrown asteroid with a significant amount of gravity, and that gravity begins to pull and suck material out of the protosolar nebula. Before Earth formed, the cloud of dust that formed Earth probably would have had a radius bigger than the moon's orbit, and all of that material would have begun to swirl in and collapse due to gravity. And as it all pressed down on itself, it would have been extremely hot, extremely warm. In fact, if I could show you a picture of what I believe the Earth would have looked like uh, shortly after formation, there's a very lovely illustration uh, in the Wikipedia page for the heavy bombardment period. And that's something I'm gonna have to teach you about next class because I'm running out of time. But look at this totally cool uh, illustration. The top picture is what I would imagine Earth would have looked like shortly after it formed. It would have been spherical, it would have been being pelted by massive meteorites and asteroids. Uh, sorry, control plus. And it would have been so bloody hot that the surface rock would have been molten and it would have been glowing like a star. Over time, Earth would have cooled off. Rock would slowly radiate away its light into space. And eventually the early Earth probably looked kind of like the moon covered in craters but it, the difference between the way the moon looks and early Earth would have looked is early Earth was so massive that it would have had massive volcanoes protruding and erupting from its surface. If you guys are big sci-fi nerds like me, if you've ever seen uh, you know, the movies where they go to the planet Vulcan and you, you go to these kind of volcano, where, all right, I noticed Ryan's got some Star Wars uh, posters in the background there. You know, in uh, what's that? Um, that third Star Wars movie, Revenge of the Sith, where they where they have that lightsaber battle on that volcano. Mustafar. Oh wow! All right, uh, there we go. Yep. Now we've got some trolls chiming in. What's it called again? Mustafar. Mustafar. I knew one of you guys was going to know this. All right. Yeah, they go to Mustafar, right? And Mustafar is like this crazy volcano. Here I am trying to talk to you guys about Star Trek Three. What the? F you guys don't know anything about Star Trek Three. You're too young, but you know about Mustafar because you're Star Wars nerds, and I love you for that. Okay, if you could imagine that volcanically active planet, that's what early Earth would have looked like. And over time, Earth would have cooled down. By the way, you know when Earth first formed, it would have been way too hot to have an atmosphere. Planets don't just show up formed out of the milk crate with with atmospheres around them. They build up their atmospheres over time. That's kind of a story for a different day. But um, <clears throat> let me show you one last slide. We'll take one last uh, set of notes here. Uh, and then uh, we'll have a little break before our lab. Sorry, uh, I'm looking for this and I'm looking for this. I want you guys to think about the ways in which a planet gets hot and how a planet stays hot. After all, Earth is basically a hot potato that's been sitting on the windowsill for 4.6 billion years. That potato should be cold by now because things cool over time, and yet it still has a lot of internal heat. One of the ways a planet gets its internal heat is from the process I just described. We call it accretion, the heat of formation. Ultimately, that comes from gravitational potential energy squeezing the planet. But there are other methods by which a planet can stay warm. One is that differentiation I told you about. 
Heavy metals sink down to the core. Lighter silicate rocks buoy up like styrofoam and water. And as they rub past each other, they generate friction. This keeps a planet hot. There's a third thing too that you may not have thought about. Radioactive decay. The ground rock all around you is full of tiny little bits of radioactive elements. In the case of Rhode Island, most of it is in the form of radon gas, but you smoke the equivalent of two Marlboro cigarettes per year, whether you like it or not, just due to background radiation. In the core, in the crust of Earth, there's all kinds of heavy isotopes and in, in, in nuclei that are popping all the time and giving off gamma rays and, and neutrinos and all kinds of other stuff. And, and while they make up, while they are small, like these, these things aren't enough to, you know, turn you into a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. If you think about all the radioactive isotopes in that little sprinkle all throughout the volume of Earth, radioactivity is actually responsible for generating something like 30 trillion watts of power from Earth's interior every day. There are 30 trillion watts of power leaking through the Earth's surface just from all of these radioactive uh, nuclei popping off. Let's take that as a note, and then we'll, we'll pick up on this next time. But the three ways a planet can gain its internal heat, the most important, the number one method, is what we call accretion. To accrete means to stick things together. So you build a snowman by rolling a, a snowball along the ground that you're accreting snow to the snowball, OK? So accretion is basically the heat of formation. And what that means is planets all start off hot, just like they were potatoes coming out of the oven, OK? The heat of formation actually comes from Gravitational potential energy. I hope you've learned enough physics with me to know what that means, because I don't have time to explain it. OK, after accretion, that's the number one method. The second two methods that a planet generates internal heat are differentiation. That's another key term from today, the differentiated layers of Earth, OK? And that just means heavy metals sink and light silicates rise. The heat generation method here is friction. But if you think your way through the paper bag too much, you'll realize that the heat is once again connected to gravitational potential energy. The sinking of heavy metals releases gravitational potential energy. I'll draw an arrow from friction to gravitational potential energy so that you know that they're connected. The third method is radioactive decay. And I have some dangerous for me demos to show you about radioactive decay. Note to self, I want you guys to remind me that on Wednesday, I have a terrifying demo to entertain you with on radioactive decay. But I'll only do it if you remind me, because otherwise I'm going to forget, right? So radioactive decay is where you get, basically, this comes from the strong force of nature, the actually maybe more the weak force of nature, where you, where you break apart nuclei and you, you generate a tiny bit of heat in the form of gamma rays and other products like that. Um, um, unstable isotopes, that's what we'll write there. Okay, final takeaway. Which planets are the warmest planets in the terrestrial zone. If you have learned that, then you have learned something in the course. I have one minute left and I'm using it up. What, which planets are the hottest planets in our solar system? Uh, oh, sorry, let me, let me say that again. Which of the terrestrial planets have the greatest amount of internal heat? Would it be the largest planets? 
the largest planets. That's right. It turns out that bigger planets stay hotter longer. I'm going to prove this to you next time using some math. Bigger planets have more reservoirs of internal heat than smaller planets. Look at the rinky-dink moon. Its lithosphere extends all the way down to its pitifully small metal core. The moon is basically frozen solid. And this is why it's got no cool geology on its surface. This is why the moon is a cratered field of, or a, a rock field covered in craters. And actually the same goes for Mercury. Mercury's lithosphere is pretty deep and Mars's lithosphere is frighteningly deep for such a large planet. Remember I told you about that InSight lander that's designed to measure Mars quakes? We wanna know more about the interior of Mars. Mars cooled off over time. Mars started out like a little proto-Earth. It had oceans and, and atmosphere and rivers and valleys. Hell, it's even possible that life could have formed on Mars. That's a, uh, something we're, we're deeply trying to understand with our latest um, Perseverance rover. But at some point, Mars went evil. It cooled off, its lithosphere froze, and it started to turn into a field of craters and frozen rock. And uh, not this week, but next week, we're gonna do a whole beautiful lab where we explore the surface of Mars. And it's one of my favorites. I'm hoping you're gonna like it too. So, oh, by the way, uh, before I stop the lecture, uh, whoever was in the background chiming in there, let's take your note as a takeaway, okay? Final point of the day right here. Bigger planets stay hotter longer, okay? And why does that matter? It's going to turn out that the more internal heat you have, the more active geology you have, okay? So warm interiors, internal heat lead to active geology more volcanoes, more earthquakes, more atmospheres, more all of the cool stuff that makes life possible on Earth. Next time, we'll flush these ideas out a little more. OK, um, you guys know what our lab is today. It's a short, very short, and reasonably fun lab where we explore craters of the moon. Um, I want you guys to uh, either download or reproduce this page, 9-5. It's, it's under lab 9. It's the lunarfeatures.pdf. I'm going to have my own moon map and my own photograph of the moon, and I'll walk you through it. Let's take a little break so I can get some more uh, iced tea. And it's cell phone o'clock. Cell phone time is 134, so, uh, so 135, 145, 150. We'll start lab at 150. You guys down for that? All right, see you then. Okay, welcome to lab number nine. Today, we are going to learn a little bit about features on the moon, <clears throat> the materials we're gonna need. We're gonna need our, <clears throat> excuse me, lunar features data sheet, which I provided for you. Um, I provided you scans of this lunar map, although I suspect you're going to just kind of want to follow along with me. Have it up on your computer, though, because if I'm not moving my phone fast enough, you might want to do some exploring on your own. <clears throat> the last thing we need is an actual photograph of the moon. And this is a, a lovely uh, image of the moon taken by a popular astrophotographer, H.R. Astro. Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> The point of today's lab isn't to just read the names of craters off of the moon. The, the point of today's lab uh, is what if you could take a, a moonlit walk with that special someone in your life and you could look up at the sky and you could point up here and say, do you see that there, baby? That's Mare Chrysium. Now, you would be a cool person that people would want to get to know, right? But it's not as easy as you think to use a map of the moon to identify features on the moon. Let's see how good you guys are. Call up that moon map. <clears throat> there is a famous uh, butterfly-shaped Maria. 
These dark splotches are of, call, of course called lunar maria. That's Latin for seas. They're not actually seas, they're volcanic rock, but whatever. They're volcanic seas. Can you tell me what the name of the butterfly-shaped maria is using the map that I provided you? Let's see who can do that. This should be an easy one, but not as easy as you think. Huh. I thought looking at the moon was like an easy thing, right? I'm talking this one right here. <clears throat> it's the butterfly shaped or the heart shaped Maria. I'm going to cue up the phone here. See if I can share. Is it, um, is it Oceanus? It is not Oceanus. Or Porcelarium? It is not Porcelarium. <clears throat> Imbrium? Nope. Hold on. Geez, I guess this isn't as easy as I thought it was, huh? Uh, could it be Tranquilitis? Tranquilitatis. Um. Tranquilitatis, which is also known as the Sea of Tranquility. It's where one of the Apollo missions landed. Tranquility Bay, right? OK. <clears throat> Let's take a look at why you got screwed up. This is an image, a map of the moon, probably drawn out by an observational astronomer who had his eyeball up to a telescope and was sketching out the features. As you know from your labs on telescope design, telescopes invert the images that you see in space upside down. So the best way to sort of orient your photograph is for us to turn the photograph like so upside down so that these two Maria here match those two Maria there. Do you see that? Okay, so <clears throat> that hopefully was a little learning lesson. You can see one, two, we're gonna kind of use the Maria to kind of hop around. There's three, I can see those three right there. And of course the, the butterfly shaped Maria is Mare Tranquilitatis. Um, the craters are numbered and there's a legend which tells you what the name of each crater is. There are also mountain ranges on the moon. This structure for instance, uh, would be an example of a mountain range. I wanna show you guys a little kind of aerial photograph science 101. Take a look at the craters, which are an indentation and now, or, or, or an intrusion. Now take a look at the mountain range, which is an extrusion. You know, extrusion means it pokes up. Intrusion means it pokes down. Jenna, on what side of the crater do you see a shadow for an intrusion? The left side. What side do you see the shadow on for the mountains? Right side. Does that make sense? It seems to suggest that the sunlight is coming from this direction, right? That's the direction of the sunlight. So you can tell if something is poking up or down based on which side the shadow is on. If the shadow's on the right, it's an extrusion. If the shadow's on the left, it's an intrusion. I'd have to imagine this is useful not only to astronomers and planetary scientists, but if you were a CIA analyst or an FBI analyst studying aerial photographs, you might use some of those same techniques and tricks, wouldn't you? Useful stuff. Okay, um, so let's also take a look at the coordinates here. So we have gridded lines of latitude and longitude. Impress me with your knowledge. Which directions do latitudes run? Which direction do longitudes run? Latitude is west to east and longitude is north south that's the direction the lines run. so you're essentially correct latitude is like a ladder but if you think about it jenna latitude actually measures north to south the lines run east to west but latitudes measure north to south lines of longitude are vertical they run north to south but they actually measure east to west let's see what you guys can do 
the, okay, let's go over to our lab here. As usual, we're going to put our name. Let's identify this as lab nine so you guys don't turn this into the wrong damn slot. That happens all the time. Oops, focus issues. Okay. And uh, this is, of course, astronomy 1010. Put your section down there just for kicks and giggles. You're either in 001, 002, or I think 104, one of those three. Okay, once you've got that, they want us to identify a crater at negative 20 degrees uh, longitude and plus 10 degrees latitude. Any of you think you can do that for me? Let's get a little more light in here. You can use your own map or you can kind of look at my screen. I'm trying to hold it steady. I might need some support here. <clears throat> Let's see if I can, I can use this to help steady myself. This ought to help a little bit. <clears throat> Where's negative 20 longitude? Um, I see negative 20. Is it towards the right? Good. It's two lines to the right. <clears throat> How about positive 10? Oh, um, is it um, one, two, like three, or like one square down in the middle? Yeah, isn't that interesting, Jenna? Because the telescope inverts the images, negative 10 latitude is up, positive 10 is down. So if we go to minus 10, minus 20 longitude, plus 10 latitude, what's the number of our crater? Once, um, is that 74, 116? It's 74. What's our man? Copernicus. That's right. All the craters on the moon are named after famous astronomers, physicists, philosophers. So this one is the crater called Copernicus. Copernicus is one of the most famous and prominent craters on the moon, easily seen with a small telescope. <coughs> Take a guess what phase this, this moon is in right now. Do you, do you uh, recognize the phase? What sort of phase is that? I thought y'all knew your moon phases. I thought I taught you things. And I know it's a gibbous, but is it per perhaps waxing gibbous? You are correct. I wanted, <clears throat> I wanted to see, Ryan, if you would understand the egg shape as gibbous. That's, so yeah, it's waxing gibbous. <clears throat> Nicely done. Okay, what we wanna do is we just wanna identify five Maria that are actually, <clears throat> excuse me, visible in the photograph. So let's see, I can kind of see five right away. One, two, three, four, five. Let's do those two. We have <clears throat> Mare Serenitatis. I'm gonna leave the Mare out or I'll write it up here because all of them have Mare out front. Mare Serenitatis, if I spelt that right. <clears throat> is Latin for serenity. Mare tranquillitatis. Uh, is uh, tranquility. Um, then we have mare nectaris, mare fecunditatis, mare chrysium. Mare fecund. Uh, 
fecundity, I think, is like abundance or giving birth or something like that. You guys have that down? What is fecundity? Let me look at it. <clears throat> the, oh, I got it right. The ability to produce an abundance of offspring or new growth, fertility. So that's the fertility, Maria. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways, moving on. We're now going to identify some mountain ranges. Let's see if you guys are any good at this. This is one of the most famous mountain ranges in the entire moon. Can you guys find that on my, photo on my uh, map or on your own maps? Can you tell me what the letters are? They put a letter on each edge of the mountain. Let's see. This mountain range is next to which Maria? Train yourself here. What Maria is this mountain range next to? I don't know if you guys are going to make my CIA team if you can't do this. Tranquilitus? False. This is Tranquilitatis. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Serentis? Serenitatis. Think serenity plus tatis, okay? All right. So what mountain range is this then, Jenna? That's Mare Serenitatis. Okay, so that means um, Paulus, is it D, no. F? Oh, am I looking at the wrong map? You're looking at the right map, but Paulus is the name of like a, a, a territory or a, it's a little Maria, okay? That's a little mini Maria. The mountain ranges, look at the shadow. Once again, the shadows on the right-hand side. They go from letter to letter, D on one side, D on the other. That's how you identify a mountain range, D to D. What mountain range is this? The Ap Apennine Mountains. Apennine or Apennine Mountains. Apennine Mountains. They're named after mountain ranges in Europe, I think. Like, uh, I think the Apennine Mountains are in Italy or something. Uh, I don't know. My geography sucks. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it right. Okay. Can you see any other mountains in this image here? Where else do you see some mountains? South of it, there's some mountains. It kind of makes a sea. Yeah. Actually, these are all separate. This is one mountain range. That's the Apennine Mountains. This is a mountain range, and I think that's another mountain range. Let's see okay. if we can identify this one and that one. What would you say? There's the Apennine Mountains, D to D. <clears throat> I would say F to F is another. Yep. Let's grab that. Uh, F is the Caucasus, Mount Caucasus Mountains. The Caucasus Mountains. And then what about that one at the bottom there? It's, it's kind of a mishmash of mountains. See if you can find one that makes sense. B to B. B to B. The Alps. Yep. So you can see they're all named after mountain ranges on Earth. Apennine, Caucasus, and Alps. All right, now we're going to take a couple minutes here. Um, we're cruising right along. We're going to identify d various types of impact craters. And I'm going to give you guys a whole damn lesson on Wednesday about different types of impact craters. It's kind of interesting. Do you guys see this impact crater right here? Let me see if I can steady my camera a bit with this, this roll of tape and twine. I don't have my hands free for this bit. All right, so let's look at some different types of craters. This would be an example of what's called a flat bottom. 
it appears that that this crater has been smoothly filled in by something. I'm guessing what it was is at some point this crater probably had a more gnarly interior, kind of like this one or like that one, or even like that one. But at some point it almost looks like some lava filled this thing and some smooth lava paved over whatever ugliness was underneath it. This is a story related to what we learned in lecture today about looking for different layers of geology covering each other up. Some of the craters, and a great example would be this one up here. They've got this little dimple in the center. Hey, uh, Ryan, Kim, Jenna, is the dimple in the center an intrusion or an extrusion? Extrusion. Very good, because you can see the shadow on the right. This is a classic example of what's called a central peak. And I think Crater Tico has a central peak. I don't want to leave this screen. Oh, can this go on the internet? Do I want this phone to go on the internet? Let me see here. I have no idea. I use that phone for anything else. You know, I never thought to try to go on the internet. So let's see. Crater Tico. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, oh, gosh. You know how this is like a new phone and I'm not good at that? OK. T-Y-C-H-O crater go. OK, uh, hold on. Let me find you guys. Here you are. Um, <clears throat> Just a moment, students. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make sure that I can see what you're seeing on my screen. Okay, cool. Let's look at a, a high-resolution image of Crater Tico. <clears throat> Many craters, and not just Tico, but feature a perfect little mountain, an extrusion, an extrusion in their center. And that's not randomness that there just happens to be a mountain in hundreds after hundreds of craters. It tells us something about the physics of impact craters. Imagine a high-speed meteoroid, a big chunk of rock from an asteroid, flying to collide with the surface of the moon. The kinetic energy of the impactor is so high that it, when it strikes the rock, it actually liquefies the rock. And, and it kind of creates the similar thing that happens when you throw a stone into water. Um, we can see some of this in the uh, legendary Milk Drop videos, YouTube, milk drop. Um, th they were first pioneered by uh, a famous MIT scientist named Doc Edgerton. Uh, <clears throat> he did it with strobe lights before we had high speed cameras. Let's see, I'm just picking a random video here. Hopefully I won't have to look at any stupid ads. Oh, I've got to look at, oh, okay. We'll mute the sound here, but I want to Oh, airplay. No, no, no. Just. Oh, shit. I think I did it bad, guys. Come on. Can I get this back? Uh... Oh, bloody hell. Okay. I'd never really tried playing on the internet with this thing before, seeing how that translated to video, but apparently it didn't go very well. Here we go. Let's see if this thing is willing to, to redo it. Okay. Share screen. Share. Oh, come on, baby. Yeah. All right. Anyways, I was hoping to show you a milk drop video where you can actually see when you, when you drop a, a blob of milk onto a surface of milk, it creates a ripple and it creates a little central peak that, that is probably similar to what happened on that impact crater. It just became frozen rock. Let's see if I can do this here. Let's get rid of that. Hey there, it's Sarah. All right, we don't care about you. We just want to get to your milk drop. Okay. Uh, damn it. What a stupid video. Uh, here we go. This is what I want. I want you guys to watch this video. Can you see that? That's some high-speed photography of a drop of milk landing. 
and it creates a sort of ripple, a wave effect. But there's this, there's a slapback that's happening there. Um, you can see there's a little slapback right there. And probably what's happening on that central peak is the rock is being liquefied. There's a slapback and then the rock freezes right in the center. Anyways, our job here, I'm, I'm kind of going off on a, 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 a wingnut tangent, so forgive me for that. Our job here is to identify three flat bottoms, three central peaks, and then we also want to find three craters that have rays. Let me once again use the internet to show you an example of crater rays, because they're going to be difficult to spot on our, on our uh, paper. And that's because we're looking at a very high up aerial photo. Crater rays. Many craters show evidence of the material that got blasted out of the, the, the basin of the crater. And if you, if you look correctly with the right angle of sunlight, you can actually see the material that got splashed out of the crater during the violent impact. We sometimes call these spoke-like structures rays or ejecta. One of our jobs is gonna be able to, to find some of those crater rays. So look at this crater here in my image. You can see that you can see the material that was splattered in it all around. Now, imagine zooming out and looking at it from very, very far away. The, the ejected material will probably look like discoloration that surrounds the crater, okay? That's what I'm expecting to see. So let's see if we can do that. Now, <clears throat> I think one of the most legendary flat bottoms, oops. Let me see if I can contrast this right. This is probably one of the most legendary flat bottom craters on the entire moon. If you look down here, I'll help us speed things up. This is crater number 230 on our map. It takes a little while to figure that stuff out, by the way. And the name of that crater is Plato. We'll list that as a flat bottom. I'm actually going to kind of zoom through this because I gave you a little lesson on the differences there. Um, <clears throat> Here's another, Oop, let me focus. This is another classic flat bottom. Can you guys identify what number that is? Let me, let me do that again, nice and slow. So there's Plato. There's the guy we want. <clears throat> what number? 14. Good. Archimedes. Um, let's see. Feel free to shout at me. I guess we, this is kind of a flat bottom there. This is kind of like a little snowman shape. That should be easy to find. Let's go to the bottom of the snowman. One, two, three. 239. Ptolemaeus. Ptolemaeus. Hopefully I got my A and E right. Yes. <clears throat> Central peaks. Now, I believe where's Crater Tico anyways? I think Tico is, let's reverse engineer this. Tico is 284. Oh, this is going to be, all right, there's 284 right there. <clears throat> if I want to find 284, Mari Nubium, dump, 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 dump. So four up, one, two, three, four. So there's Mari Nubium. One, two, three. So that must be that must be Crater Tico. That's the one that had the real prominent central peak. I'm just going to make a note of that in case I want to find it later. Um, <clears throat> that looks like a pretty good central peak right there. What? Ooh, this is kind of a mess here because it's right on a crease. So there's. Um, Archimedes, doot doot. So there's Archimedes, doot doot. 12. 
or I, I can't really see. It's on the scene. I think it's 17. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's 17. It's kind of messy because the you can't see, but that's where the crease of the map is. So <clears throat> let's say it's 17 Aristillus. Aristillus. Uh, 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 okay, one more central peak. What would be fun? Uh, I guess the top of the snowman will be fast. So fast is always fun. Let's use that one. One, two, three, 19. <clears throat> Arzakel. Arzakel. All right, the rays are kind of a, <clears throat> a damn, a whole damn thing. Now, I don't know if I'm seeing this right here, but. Oh, okay. Let's do this. Do you guys see how this crater has like some gray stuff around it? I suspect that those are crater rays. That that's some ejected material. I'm not 100% sure, but that would be my guess. Let's find this dude just above Mare Serenitatis 187. Manilius. Okay, look at this little dude. Can you guys see that stuff, that material around it? Mm-hmm. Let's see if we can find that little dude. Mari Serenitatis, it looks like 82. 82 is Dawes. C. Here. See that gray stuff surrounding it? That looks like it might be ejected material to me. That's between Mare Vaporum in the sinus medi. It's 283. Ooh, Trisnecker. Try Snicker. Uh, S N E C K. All right. All right. I'm, I'm not going to have us do part D because I want to keep today's lab short and sweet. I am for our final act of awesomeness. I am going to have us identify the size of some lunar features. I think that's a pretty cool and interesting exercise. So I want you guys to think about map making and scale making, right? Uh, let's say I have a photograph of the moon, correct? I know that the moon's true diameter is 34 76 kilometers. It's been measured to a pretty high degree of precision. So that's the moon's diameter. But I can also measure the diameter of the moon on the page and find out how big the photograph is in millimeters. The reason I would want to do that is so that I could come up with something called a scale factor. A scale factor is kind of like the scale that you have in a map that says one inch equals five miles or something like that. I want to know basically my scale factor is going to tell me how many kilometers are covered in one millimeter on the page, kilometers per millimeter. Because when I look at a crater or a feature on the moon, it's not always obvious to me how big that thing is. If I can measure its size in millimeters, I can multiply by my scale factor to convert to kilometers. So let's do that with our photograph, okay? Let's try to measure the diameter of this with a ruler. Um, we always try to measure astronomical bodies vertical because they bulge along their equator. 
also we can't see the whole diameter of the moon uh, except vertically in this photograph. So I'm going to have you guys help me measure it. Remember that the largest slice through a cookie is its diameter. So I'll put zero there and I'll basically try to find its largest slice. What would you guys say is the diameter of this thing? Let's see if we can focus on it. Is that like 24 or 22.4? No, 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 you had it right. 24 millimeters. Is, you had it right the first time because we want it in millimeters. So let's do this. For the scale of our photo, this is where we're going to have our scale factor. We're going to divide 3476 kilometers. Let's just use this thing as the division bar divided by, uh, shoot, what was it? Was it 24? Oh, sorry. Wait a minute. No, you didn't. Sorry. You, let's get that. Yes, correct. It was, it was, I think it was 22 plus four. So 20, or uh, I'm getting yeah. confused. Yeah. So what is that? In, that's 22 centimeters. What's that in millimeters? 220. But each of those little ticks is a millimeter, right? It yeah, clearly goes past 224. 224. That's right. That's what we want. Okay, let's not mess up our metrics at the end. Can you guys do that for me? Can you divide 3476 by 224? How many sig figs are we going to keep, my scientifically literate friends? Is it three? That's right, because your worst measurement has three. So give me your answer to three sig figs, Jen, properly rounded. I got 15.5. Nice. And let's put proper units on that. That's 15.5 kilometers per millimeter. All right. Let's say you want to know the size of a couple of different features. Remember this guy? Do you remember what this crater is called? Plato. Good. Let's figure out how big Plato is. Um, let's measure the length of the Apennine Mountains. So we know how long the longest mountain is. And then, I don't know, let's pick one of these Maria. Let's come up with the diameter of Mare Serenitatis, okay? And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to measure these features in millimeters. So let's do Plato first. Six millimeters about. Um, on my on my eyeball, it's you're not far off, but that's my that's my best positioning. I, oh I'm yeah, five. I would say five even. You weren't too far off. It was hard to see on my phone. Let's do the Apennine Mountains next. Let's just kind of bash this out. I know they're not straight, but you know, who is these dates? Let's see. Uh, if you want to go from this end to this end, how many millimeters would you say that is? 35. Yeah, OK. 35 millimeters, roughly. And then, um, you know, this is kind of egg-shaped, so we have to decide. What I was thinking about measuring this is, I know that one of the Apollo landings took place in Serenity Bay. They actually drove a dune buggy across the Maria to the highlands. These areas are called the highlands. So they could measure some old geological rocks, measure their dates. That's how we detected the age of our solar system. I wonder what kind of a drive that was like having to go across this whole thing. Let's let's kind of just measure it from like, kind of like the longest end. I don't know. What would you say is the rough dimensions of this? I'd say like 43. Yeah, somewhere between 44. Let's go with 43. What were you saying, Ryan? I was going to say 43. Oh, perfect. All right. Now, here's your job, guys. Let's multiply each of these numbers by our scale factor. Let's keep the proper number of sig figs. How many sig figs are we going to keep for this one? Two. Or honestly, just one. One. How about here? 
Two. And two. Okay, so give me my numbers. Multiply this times that and round it properly. 80. So our first one is 80 kilometers. Five hundred forty kilometers. How about Serenitatis? I got six hundred seventy kilometers. All right. Hopefully, you guys in the background are fact checking her too, so that no one makes a mistake. So before we end our lab today, and I think this clocked in at roughly an hour, so or I'm a little under that, but that's okay. Um, let's think about what all these dimensions mean. This crater Plato is about 80 kilometers across. How would that compare, say, to the state of Rhode Island? Let's type Rhode Island into Wiki. Let's just kind of learn something here. I forgot that I can go on the internet on my phone. That's kind of useful. Um, the length of Rhode Island down here is 70 or 80 kilometers. It's basically 80 kilometers by 60 kilometers. So you get the point there, right? If Rhode Island is 80 kilometers tall, that means, oops, come on, focus. This crater, Crater Plato, is the length of Rhode Island. Try to imagine walking from the bottom of Rhode Island to the top of Rhode Island. You could do it, but it'd probably take you a couple of days, right? Maybe two days to do that. I could walk the bike path in a good fraction of a day. The bike path is like half of Rhode Island or something. Well, maybe not. I don't know. Anyways, that's a big ass crater compared to you. You'd be a little tiny mouse inside that thing, right? How about the journey that the astronauts would have had to take? That's like six or 700 kilometers across. Could you imagine what that journey was like? Hell, if I go on a road trip to Florida or Texas, that's an undertaking. You got to plan ahead. You got gas stations, you got Super 8 motels, roadside attractions and rest stops. Now imagine that you're on a lunar rover and you're taking that trip. Look at this dude. Can you imagine this dude traveling hundreds of kilometers? I don't know if they actually had to. They might have landed close to the thing, but that would probably be pretty scary to be in a dune buggy on the moon where you're in the vacuum of space and there's no gas stations. Better not pop a tire or you're dead, right? <laughs> like That would probably be a pretty scary and frightening undertaking. The astronauts who landed on the moon were total badasses. That's one of my points. Anyways, okay, so I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the moon. You also learned a little bit about how to work with maps and create scale factors. You learned that this crater is the size of Rhode Island. What's the name of that crater again? Plato. Good. Plato. Okay. I'd say we're done. I'd say that's a day's work right there. Okay. So there's, there's your lab. Make sure you've got all of that data. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. All right. Uh, so I'll see you guys on Wednesday. I'm still behind on grading. One of these days, I'm going to grade some papers. <laughs> okay. Just please bear with me as I try to glue the fragmented pieces of my life together. I will grade papers at some point. Um, if you're turning them in, it's going to be a okay. I got to get on top of that thing. Uh, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Sound like a plan? Okay, over and out. <laughs>